Good morning, Grace. Welcome to our Back to Church Sunday again. (laughs) Please stand and join us to worship.
upcoming Saturday, June the 5th, is our church-wide garage sale. And all the proceeds from the garage sale are going towards Whispering Pines Bible Camp. So we're looking for donations for things to sell at the garage sale. You can stop by the church anytime this week, Monday to Friday, and drop off your items. We're also looking for some help. So if you can help out in any way, contact Isla Contos or Carrie Dick. And if you have some baked goods that you can donate so we can sell that as well, we'll take that too. Pretzel Shane, Pretzel Shane, I have some cookies. Want to try one? Oh, hey, sure, Stein. I'll try one of your cookies. Oh, oh, you even wrapped it up for me. That's nice. That's Perfect. great. It's great. Well, it looks like a cookie. <coughs> oh, how do you like it? It's not bad. My special ingredient is S A L T. Lots of it. It's delicious. I don't know what it stands for. Uh, make sure you drop that stuff off uh, this week. Today we have a couple different events. Uh, the first would be here at 2 o'clock for anyone that's, uh, their families, would love for you guys to come out here at 2 o'clock. We have put together um, a, I guess, an, what we call an amazing race. It's just a, an hour of activities for you to do as your family. Uh, we've got some different challenges and things like that for you uh, to go and try to accomplish, kind of like a car rally style. So would love for you and your family to come on out at 2 o'clock this afternoon to participate participate in that. So if that is something that you feel you're going to do, uh, just let me know here during our service afterwards so uh, I can plan accordingly. And then further at three o'clock this afternoon, we do have a prayer walk and that is in the Bay Springs, Bayview and Bayside neighborhood. So at three o'clock meet at the Daybreak Church to go and do that. Next Sunday, we will be, uh, will be our camp Sunday. So we're going to be highlighting uh, camps, especially Whispering Pines Bible Camp. And uh, we'll have some different uh, camp-themed uh, music and testimonies uh, next Sunday. Out in the foyer, you can pick up a baby bottle if you haven't already for the Airdrie Pregnancy Care Center baby bottle fundraising campaign. That goes until Father's Day. So uh, there's still time to pick that up. As well, if you would like to give this morning, you can do so. Uh, there's a debit and an offering plate in the foyer. Uh, this past Sunday, uh, our youth director, Connor, was able to baptize one of our youth, uh, Brendan Storier. And uh, we do have a short video that we'll play in a minute, which basically uh, shows the baptism. So uh, it's always exciting when uh, one of... Uh, our young people decide to get baptized and make that public declaration. So we'll show that here in a minute. But before we do that, let's open up in prayer and uh, we'll watch that video. Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you for the beautiful day you've given us and thank you that we can again be together uh, here in your church uh, to worship and glorify you, to learn about you through your word, to fellowship together. So thank you for that. And we also just want to thank you, Lord, that you continue to provide for all of our needs and the needs of our church. So thank you for those gifts and those that give this morning. And we also thank you for Brandon and his testimony, which we're going to see here in a moment with this step of baptism. 
We commit him into your hands and pray, Lord, that your spirit would rest mightily upon him and that you would continue to guide and direct his steps in ways that would allow everybody that sees Brendan uh, and how he lives his life, that they would actually see and know you more through how he chooses to live. So we think of him and thankful for the witness that he demonstrates through this baptism. And now as we continue to uh, fellowship through uh, the listening of your word and uh, music that we're going to uh, sing, uh, Father, thank you for uh, this time. And pray that you would give us ears to hear your word and that as we uh, proclaim through music that you would be glorified and honored this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Water is actually very warm, which is nice. Brendan, have you received Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior in your life? I have. Do you accept Jesus as the Son of God? I do. And will, from this moment forward, follow Jesus for the rest of your life? I will. Then upon profession of faith, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. and join us again. bringing us back together as one body. And Lord, we just pray that you unite us in hearts and minds. Lord, help us to just focus on you as the, the one and only. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, uh, Grace, and to those who are well, uh, watching online here this morning, and 
Uh, last weekend, uh, we had a small little gathering here uh, for uh, Brendan uh, Stroyer's uh, baptism, and it, it was a Pentecost Sunday last Sunday, and so, you know, a special day in that way, and so it was great to uh, have him baptized. Uh, we had one other that was supposed to be baptized that day, uh, Hudson Santos, and Hudson said, the only way I wouldn't be able to come is if my wife went into labor. And sure enough, Saturday night, she goes into labor, uh, has a baby boy named Samuel on Sunday. So, yeah, congratulations to them as well. We also had a, um, another uh, congrats out to uh, James uh, Damocles, our worship director, and Rachel Paulus. Uh, they were united in marriage last Saturday, so that was a great occasion for those who were able to see it online. So, again, a lot of good things uh, were happening, and so we were encouraged by that. In your um, uh, bulletins, there's an outline in which you can follow along with uh, for today's message. But as I finish the series on relationship builders, I want to focus on the topic of encouraging one another. And if there has ever been a year to encourage others, this would be the year to do it. We all have gone through different, so many different changes in their lives. And because of this pandemic, many have lost, uh, you know, work, uh, have lost their businesses, have ended up in the hospital, lost loved ones, have not been able to uh, visit family and friends for months. And really, their whole routine of life has been flipped upside down. We all have endured a lot this past year. And many people today are facing high levels of stress. They're facing high levels of depression and mental illness. And when I look at the early church, although the early church did not face a pandemic such as we are going through right now, they experienced very trying times that threatened their relationships, that really discouraged them. And from widespread famine in the mid-first century to false teachings that were starting to creep into the local congregations, and then also persecution from local authorities put great pressure on the early church. And relationships began to become fragile. And Paul, in his writings of much of the New Testament, he tries to focus on these one another statements. How do we how do we live with one another? How do we treat one another in a time like this? And, and he wanted to focus on this one, one another statement, that of encouraging each other. The author of Hebrews recognized that the early church was going through trying times. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 to 36 writes, remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you endured in a great conflict of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. The author of Hebrews, Paul, in his writings and others, recognized the things that the early church was going through. And when the apostle Paul had planted churches all throughout the Roman Empire, he returned on second, third missionary journeys to encourage these churches, or he wrote uh, letters to other churches, to really encourage and build up the believers as they faced hard times. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 2, we see the aim of Paul. And he writes, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. Paul knew that he couldn't do this alone. And, and so he also sends others to encourage local congregations. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 8, he writes, I am sending Tychicus to you for the express purpose that he may encourage your hearts. But more than that, he challenges 
each member of the local congregations that he had established, that they would mutually encourage one another. When you look at uh, the New Testament writings, there's over 30 references to the word encourage. So we obviously know that th this is something that is really much very needed. And the phrase encourage one another is used at least six times. From these passages then, what do we learn? What do we learn about encouraging one another? I think first of all, I want to look at you know, the reasons for encouragement. When the writers of the New Testament understood what, every, things, what were happening in their midst, one of the reasons was simply to encourage those who were struggling with sin. And I think we can all put ourselves in this category. You know, as a pastor, a long-time Christian, or a new believer, as Romans 3 verse 23 states, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, no one is perfect. I'm not perfect standing up here today. We all go through our struggles. We all have our different challenges in life. And so we all need encouragement from one another to keep going, to keep becoming more and more like God who is perfect. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13 states, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You know, last week, uh, weekend, it was Pentecost Sunday, as mentioned, and, and uh, you know, in the small little gathering that we were, had, we were able to hear the testimony of Brendan. And he shared, you know, some of the deep struggles that he had and, and you know, the, the sin that was gripping his life. But it was great to see his step of baptism. It was great to, you know, see his renewed commitment. But then even more than that, it was great to see how his friends stood by him and encouraged him through this past year and helping him come back into a life of faith with God. You know, your prayers, your conversations, your acceptance of others can encourage them to live for God. And so, you know, pray for people, encourage them to keep living for God. And then we see in the New Testament writings, encourage those who are just struggling with life. You know, it doesn't have to be sin that we struggle with. It's just life in general. You know, raising families, there can be many struggles that way. There can be struggles as you reach an, you know, an older demographic. There's struggles in the workplaces. And sometimes you see that people are overwhelmed, discouraged, and dealing with too many things, especially, you know, in this last year. They need encouragement. The author of Hebrews knew that hard times on the Christian community was depleting them of hope and motivation to carry on. The church at this, t at this time was facing you know, persecution from the Roman Empire and, and local authorities directly targeted the early uh, Christians for their beliefs. And some lost their lives, others, they lost their homes and despair and discouragement had set in. The author of Hebrews chapter, in chapter 10, verses 23 and 24, he writes, Let's hold firmly to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let's consider how to encourage one another in love and good deeds, not abandoning our own meeting together, as is the habit of some people, but encouraging one another and all the more as you say the, see the day drawing near. You know, the word encourage in verse 24, and I think it's only maybe used in this context, maybe one other place in the New Testament, but it is the, the word paroxymus, which means to incite, to stimulate, to stir up. And in this context, it is to stir up people toward good deeds. Other versions translate this word, spur one another on toward love and good deeds or help each other to love others and do good. Motivate one another to acts of love and good works. 
Another translation says, provoke one another to love and good deeds. And another one says, stir up one another to love and good works. You see, the early church, they had to find ways to stay connected. They had to find ways to encourage one another to keep going and live that life of faith that they had started out with in God. Interesting, for the first 300 years, the early church had no formal building, you know, much like we would have today. But they, they simply, you know, in Jerusalem, for example, they met in the temple courtyard and often just in smaller settings from house to house. It wasn't until the emperor Constantine was converted to Christianity in uh, AD 312 that he then made Christianity the official religion of the empire. And once he did this, church buildings began to spring up all over the countryside and, and people began to congregate in larger group settings. But until that time, believers you know, found ways to stay connected. They found ways to encourage one another. We obviously live in interesting times right now in this last year and a half. And I don't believe the church is facing direct persecution because of our beliefs. You see it, you know, everyone's suffering uh, as a result of all these restrictions. But these lockdowns, these restrictions, they have created instability in the church across the globe. Many are facing the challenges of this new paradigm. And it has been hard to grapple with new routines, uh, theological questions, and practical decisions. I think what many people struggle with is a form of their Christianity that has been taken away. And, and you know, I too have struggled with these restrictions. I, I would love for this building to be wide open and, you know, for this place to be filled up. I have struggled in, yeah, a, a lot of these type of restrictions. I have had theological questions that, you know, I wrestle with in my mind. I have, you know, tried to think through practical decisions. And the elders have been wrestling with a lot of these same things as probably all of us have been. What is the right path forward? What is the right thing to do at this time. And we're trying to discern God's way in our midst. The church, however, is not a building, but a gathered group of believers who come together to worship God and encourage one another. Although we have not been able to meet in a large group for, you know, it's been over a year now, we can do you know, we continue to do things in smaller settings, you know, very much like the early church did. That was their form until another form took place, you know, 300 years later. Christianity has always found a way to survive and thrive throughout the centuries. And throughout this last year, you know, we have tried to do the same. How do we keep moving forward? How do we keep following God in our midst? And throughout this year, we have tried to find ways of moving forward. We've gone to three services trying to accommodate, you know, our congregation and for other visitors who would come in. We have kept most of our small groups going. And to me, though, the key is how do we continue to stay connected and encourage each other? And so that's what I want to kind of spend the rest of this time on is the methods of encouragement. How do we go about lifting someone else's spirits up? You know, some things we cannot change, but one thing we can change is our attitudes and focus on the ways that we can encourage one another. In Scripture, there's, you know, numerous examples in which believers encouraged one another. And one of these ways in which I have shared, you know, in this whole last year is simply through good deeds. I think that is a great way to encourage one another. A good deed really indicates I care for you. 
We read in Hebrews 10, 24, let's consider how to encourage one another in love and good deeds. Two weeks ago, uh, we, or three weeks, we wanted to encourage the mothers in our congregation with the gift. And, and don't worry, men, uh, your, your day is coming, Father's Day is coming up. And so you, you will have a, you know, something as a surprise coming your way here. But we really wanted to bless the mums in our congregation. And by delivering them bath bombs on Mother's Day, and then some of our drivers also took uh, some of our, you know, uh, bakery or goods, breads out there as well to them. Interestingly, some of the emails that I received back because of that good deed that we did in that uh, for the congregation, one email that I received says, just want to say thank you to Grace for the lovely Mother's Day gift. Give thanks to everyone who is participating in this thoughtful activity, from the one who do the shopping to the one or those who do the packing and those who do the delivery. Thanks for Pastor John's leadership. And then another one wrote, Please pass along my thanks for the Mother's Day Triple B gift. Bath, balm, and buns. Very thoughtful. Another one wrote, I was so blessed, Pastor John, when you came to my door with the Mother's Day gift. How very kind and thoughtful. Apologies for you having to stand in the cold. Hopefully in the near future we will be able to gather together in person once again. And then one of the drivers uh, had sent me an email back and he said, Thank you for praying that drivers would bless and also get a blessing. I was blessed to take with a take-home piece of Tux Blitz Tort. Wow, very tasty, he said. And then he went to another home and he said the husband was grinning and she at one point was almost in watery eye tears for the bakery. You know, good deeds really encourage one another. And so I encourage you to do that. Another way the New Testament believers encouraged others was through God's Word. And Scripture, sharing God's Word, was a primary way in which believers were encouraged and built up. Reading God's Word, listening to a sermon, attending Bible studies, these can be great encouragement for you to keep going forward in your faith. One of the requirements of an elder was that of being able to Encourage others through sound doctrine. And in Titus chapter 1 verse 9, it notes that an elder must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message he was taught. Then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching. But the words of God are just not reserved for elders and pastors. They're for everyone. And in 1 Thessalonians 4.18, Paul says, Therefore, Encourage one another with these words. In chapter 4, Paul was, you know, trying to remind the Thessalonians of the hope that believers had in the return of Christ and that those who had died would also be risen with him. You see, what was happening in, in that context was that many of the believers who had died, the families were thinking, well, if Jesus comes now, what happens to my loved one who passed away? Will they see Jesus ever again? And Paul reminds them, yes, when Jesus returns, all those in Christ will be resurrected to life forevermore. And so I think being reminded of God's word and his promises, it brings hope to those who are going through trying and discouraging times. Another way the New Testament believers encouraged others was through personal visits. You know, something that all of us can do today. Although maybe not in this last year so much. You know, this last year really has been difficult for many people because of the inability to connect with family or friends or to see loved ones in the hospital and nursing homes. God has created us to be in relationship with one another. And when it is severed, it can become emotionally draining and discouraging you know, to keep on going. And in some ways, I think the Apostle Paul, he understood what each one of us are going through right now. You know, the, the longing to connect, but the inability to do so. In his desire to visit the Roman church, he writes to them in Romans chapter 1, verses 10 and 
10, 10 to 13. He said, I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I had planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now. I think these words of Paul are very similar to what we're going through right now in the pandemic. He wanted to be there, but he was prevented from doing so. He was prevented from connecting with other believers. But God had a plan for Paul's life. And God has a plan in this day and age for us as a church. You know, we might not be aware of it, what is happening maybe behind the scenes of what God is doing, but God is at work. And we're not sure what pre prevented Paul from visiting the Roman church. You know, was it God's plan or was it Satan's attacks? But what we see is that Paul did not fight it. You know, he rolled with the punches and he followed God into areas that he would not have gone otherwise. You know, we as a church, as a global church, we have moved into areas that we would not have done otherwise because of this type of year that we have had. You know, in a recent survey put out by Faith Today, 88% of evangelical attenders now have tried online worship. And then 63% of evangelical regular attenders want online services to remain after the post-pandemic. So it's something that we would never have done as a church probably. But because of this, we are now doing it. We are streamlining to our audience. 88% of evangelical attenders, however, they do miss attending in-person services. So, so as soon as we can open up like this, I'm going for it. Because we need this type of fellowship as well. 12% of evangelical attenders say they haven't been keeping in contact with fellow congregants at all. And so, you know, it, it's been a year in which God has moved us in different ways and we've tried to adapt, we've tried to remain flexible. And although Paul wished, you know, to personally connect with the believers in Rome, ultimately, it was God's will. And as he ends the book uh, to the Romans, he writes in Romans 15, 32, Then, by the will of God, I will be able to come to you with a joyful heart, and we will be an encouragement to one another. Another way the early church encouraged each other was through giving. You know, some really do have the gift of giving. And I have been greatly encouraged by those, you know, in this congregation who have a generous spirit. It has given me motivation to keep going in times when, you know, I've just been worn out or I'm making decisions all the time. There's so many things that are coming at me from so many different angles. And these gifts that have come in timely manners have really encouraged me to keep going. You see, gifts do that for one another. Barnabas, uh, he was known for his encouragement to the early church. And in Acts chapter 4, verses 32, uh, 34 to 37, it says that all the believers were, to, uh, were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sale, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. You see, the early church, they shared freely with one another. They were looking out, how can I bless you? How can I encourage you? How can I help you, you know, continue to walk in faith? And then we also see the early church, they encouraged others through letters. Uh, letters, you might say, what's a letter these days? Uh, 
It's kind of almost foreign uh, to us. But when the early church made inroads into Gentile territory, there were questions that were posed by some that needed to be addressed. And so the way they addressed this was through a letter that was sent to the church in Antioch. In Acts chapter 15, uh, 30 to 32, there's a resolution to some of their questions and then a letter is sent to them. And it says, So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. Well, letter writing really has fallen away in our day and age. And to receive a letter in the mail, it's probably almost a, you know, a surprise. Oh, somebody's actually written me and it's, it's almost something very special. This last year, I've, you know, because of the pandemic, I think some people uh, reverted back to that method. And I actually received a few letters in the mail uh, like that. But most times, you know, the, the new method is through email or, you know, text messaging or social media. I have received, you know, numerous emails from, from uh, this congregation and uh, in my former congregations, you know, encouraging emails for me to, uh, you know, hang in there, to keep going, uh, you're on the right track, or to say how a sermon hit home to them. And I have in my computer a file folder called Encouraging Emails. And so I drop these encouraging emails into them, and every now and then I'll kind of look back in one, and, you know, it gives me kind of encouragement to keep going. That, yes, you know, God is, you know, still at work. God is, you know, leading me in this way. And so, and so you know, we can encourage each other through the words that we say and give to one another. And then we, f we find a final way here is to encourage others through your faith. Paul was encouraged by the faith of other believers. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 6-7, to he states, But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us, just as also we long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. Your faith can encourage others to keep going. You know, it's been a difficult year trying to keep up with everyone in the congregation here uh, just because all of the disconnections. And, and sometimes I kind of wonder, okay, where is someone at spiritually? Where is someone, you know, at relationally with others in, in, in the context of the church and their faith? And, and it has not always been easy because there's so many things that are happening and going on. And, and then... I get a word, maybe from someone else. And it greatly encourages me because I hear that they are carrying on in the faith. Uh, they are still connected in some way. They've done, you know, they've connected with some group uh, within our church setting. And so it's great for me to hear these type of stories. Stay connected, you know, with God through this pandemic. Let your continuing faith be an encouragement to others. These are why testimonies are so powerful, like Brendan's that uh, we had seen last Sunday. You know, they reveal the work of God in a person's life that others can identify with. You know, God is at work, and sharing these stories encourages others to keep going. And so as I close here this morning, the Greek word for encourage is perikaleo, which means to come alongside and call. The Holy Spirit is described as our parakletos, and which means God who comes alongside you to guide you, to encourage you, to comfort you. Our English word parallel, which stems from para, means to be next to and stay in exact proximity to the object or person. You know, it's an interesting, to me, an interesting visual illustration of what it looks like to encourage someone else. No matter which way you zigzag in life, and we all zigzag in life, 
God is always parallel with you, calling and reaching out to you. You know, Jesus said, I am with you to the very end of this age, Matthew 28, 20. And in Hebrews 10, 23, which we read, God who promised is faithful. See, God always runs parallel with your life. Whereas your parallel to someone might be momentary, God's parallel is always with you. Your parallel might diverge in time from others and you become farther apart, non-parallel. Whereas God's parallel seeks to converge with people so that they become one with him. To me, when I look at that word, to encourage one another, to encourage someone else, is to be that para-kaleo, coming alongside them, calling and reaching out to them, and drawing them in ever closer. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11, Therefore encourage one another, or therefore para-kaleo one another. Come alongside them and build each other up. You know, and so as I end here this morning, how can you encourage? How can you come alongside someone to encourage them in this week? And so the one challenge I want to give you, maybe some homework even uh, this week, would simply be today to, I, I invite you to choose someone who you can encourage this week. Who is God putting on your mind? Maybe someone from the congregation, maybe someone in your workplace, someone maybe in your family. But who is that one person? And if you want to take two or three or four, you can do that. But at least choose one. And then choose how you will do this based on maybe one of these six methods. You know, whether it's a good deed, maybe it's through God's word, Maybe it's through a personal visit. We can have people in our backyards and and do that. Maybe it's uh, through giving to them, through a letter, or through an act of faith. You know, when you do this, whatever method you choose, if each of us can just encourage one person, that will make a tremendous difference. And so as I end this series on relationship builders, you know, we had looked at, you know, what it means to you know, accept one another. And today to be in, you know, encouraging one another. But hear this benediction from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Amen. Amen. Well, may God bless you. We're going to sing one final song here this morning as Jen comes up with the team. I invite you to stand and join us again.
grace, the grace. There's rest for the weary. Rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. So lay down your burdens. Lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. Have a great week.